Hello and welcome to Fragility and Resilience, a conversation about art, ecology, and this contemporary moment. Um, I'm Sonia Skindrud. I joined Basilica Hudson's board of directors in 2019. Founded in 2010 by musician Melissa Oftemar and filmmaker Tony Stone, Basilica Hudson is a nonprofit multidisciplinary art center in Hudson. Basilica Hudson celebrated its 10 year anniversary in 2020 with the expansion of Basilica Green, our commitment to cultural and environmental advocacy and action. This month, we're excited to partner on important arts and ecology programming with the Thomas Cole National Historic Site and the Olana Partnership at the Olana State Hus Historic Site in celebration of the cross-pollination collaborative exhibition currently on view. This merging of arts and ecology is central to our expanded mission, and it's an honor to partner with these leaders in the region and to be a platform for the amazing artists and scholars who explore this intersection. Before we begin, we'd like to recognize the indigenous peoples who lived on and together with this land before us. It is with gratitude that we acknowledge that we are gathering on the ancestral lands of the Mohawk and other Haudenosaunee peoples, as well as Mohican, Lenape, and other Algonquian speaking peoples. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. We respect the enduring relationships that exist between these peoples and the land and waterways. And now I'm very happy to introduce Kate Mencaneri, curator and director of exhibitions and collections of the Thomas Cole National Historic Site, co-curator, of the Cross-Pollination Exhibition, who will co-moderate this panel. Sonia, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here tonight with everyone, and I'm so thrilled to be partnering um, with Basilica and with Olana, and it's really, with our guests tonight are incredible, so thank you. Cross-Pollination, Heed Cole Church in Our Contemporary Moment is one simultaneous exhibition at the Thomas Cole National Historic Site and Frederick Church's Olana at the Olana State Historic Site. It explores the interplay between art and science across generations. And I really hope if you haven't seen the exhibition, please come and see it, but it's on the occasion of this collaborative um, exhibition that we are having this series of uh, talks. Um, and the exhibition itself is, uh, includes over 85 works by 25 artists and it will be on view through October 31st. So come and see it. It was created by the Thomas Cole site with the Olana Partnership at Olana State Historic Site and Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. The national tour is organized by Crystal Bridges and support for this exhibition and its national tour is provided by Art Bridges. Additional major support has been provided by the Henry Luce Foundation and others. Thank you. So as I was saying, cross-pollination um, explores pollination in nature and ecology through artworks. And we also consider pollination as a metaphor for the interplay between art and science and relationships among artists across generations. Um, so we start at the two historic artist homes with the 19th century artist Frederick Church and Thomas Cole and Martin Johnson Heed. And the exhibition extends to future generations, starting with their daughters, Emily Cole and Isabel Downey Church, to artists working in our own contemporary moment who continue to find inspiration in art and science, and many of whom are wrestling with critical issues and questions and actions around climate change, biodiversity, widespread habitat loss, and how to balance the built and natural worlds. So tonight, I'm, I've just been looking forward to this conversation all day because um, I admire the artists and the speakers on this panel. Um, but tonight we'll get to hear from the artists in the exhibition and um, the artists that we selected for this panel address uh, ecological loss, but also resilience. And I feel like that's really important. Um, Sailor Morris created a site-specific installation of Eclipse. It's an homage to the 1914 extinction of the passenger pigeon. And Rachel Sussman's series um, on view at both sites, the oldest living things in the world is a series where the artist worked with scientists to track down and create an index and then photograph the oldest living things alive in the world. So for instance, a 9,500 year old spruce. Can you believe that? Um, I find it super inspiring and um, excited to 
uh, hear from our artists and our esteemed guest, Dr. Scott Manning, and my colleague, Will Coleman, is here to introduce our panelists. Thank you. Thanks, Kate, and thanks all for being with us today. Uh, on behalf of the Olana Partnership and my colleagues in the New York State Park System at Olana, um, I'm very pleased to be in partnership with the Thomas Cole National Historic Site and Basilica Hudson, um, as well as the other national venues of this uh, national touring project, of which we're very fortunate to have the fullest realization with many works unique to our region in the Mid-Hudson Valley, um, many uh, new works made specific for our installations across the Hudson River Skywalk. Um, so there's much to see in, in the heart of it all here in the Mid-Hudson Valley with so much art history and art present. Um, that's been one of the most exciting things about this project to me as a specialist in uh, 19th century American landscape painting, seeing um, how the past is not past. Uh, the past is very much present in the work of these speakers who are with us today. Uh, we see artists uh, historic wrestling with environmental loss and change, the railroad, um, the, the toll of industry, and uh, already some of the concerns of the present um, manifesting in the work of uh, Cole, Church, and Heed, um, as well as their daughters, uh, Emily and Isabel Downey Church. So it's really exciting to see the continuing relevance of these sites we know and love, um, and to see how these contemporary works speak uniquely in these historic artist environments that were always sites of contemporary creativity. And we greatly appreciate um, the partnership with Basilica Hudson and helping to share that message with a wider audience. Please do come and see these uh, partnered installations uh, before October 31st when the show then travels to uh, the Crystal British Museum of American Art in Northwestern Arkansas. Um, there will be a Q&A at the end. Please do at any point along the way, feel free to send in a question in the chat function below and we'll do our best to get to them. Um, and I will introduce all of our speakers um, at the opening before uh, turning to each of them in turn. Uh, the New York-based artists Susanna Saylor and Edward Morris, known collectively as Saylor Morris, use diverse media to investigate and contribute to the development of ecological consciousness. Saylor Morris are also the founders of Toolshed, housed at Basilica Hudson and the Canary Project. Rachel Sussman is a New Mexico-based artist whose critically acclaimed decade-long project, The Oldest Living Things in the World, combines art, science, and philosophy. We're loving living with her uh, remarkable work, Antarctic Moss, in uh, Isabel Church's sitting room at Olana. Uh, Dr. Scott Manning Stevens is a citizen of the Aguasasni Mohawk Nation and associate professor and director of Native American and Indigenous Studies at Syracuse University with primary interest in Native American cultures of the Northeast from the pre-colonial period to the present. And now let's turn it over to our friend, Sailor Morris. So uh, coming to you from our studio here at Syracuse University, um, we're gonna share our screen here and take a very quick walk through our practice um, before pausing on Eclipse, the, the work that's being exhibited at uh, Cole site as part of this uh, exhibition and turning briefly to some work in directions that we're heading in now with a emphasis on, on landscape, how we think about time, and that's a real overlap with Rachel's work, how we think about keep time. The Thomas Cole site provided another interesting challenge, and we'll show you how to resolve that project there. So um, these are just a few slides that um, are from our original research on the project when we were looking at um, images of the passenger pigeon. They were written about, um, but not really photographed in motion. There's uh, a couple um, images of Martha, who was the last living passenger pigeon. Um, but uh, for example, this illustration, and this contemporary image by Walton Ford. Um, the, uh, the bird itself, um, we're gonna show a, a very short clip um, and the animation uh, relied on this, uh, it's a CGI model of a, of, a, of a bird. So there's actually 250,000 individual birds in the animation. Um, originally, first there are dots, and then, and then they take this form that we use the CGI models for. Again, uh, some more of our, our research for the piece. Um, and we'll show just a, 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 a few seconds of this piece. So the birds come from far off, and they inhabit this tree. Um, it's a form of a black locust. And then they kind of become like the leaves of the tree. They kind of inflame the tree for a while. Um, and then at a certain point in the, um, the video, it's a seven minute loop, they start to ascend. And there's a, a kind of shift in tone to the sound piece as well at that point. It becomes almost triumphant. Um, and then they ascend upwards. 
um, in increasing numbers, so they mentioned 250,000 of them. Um, but then there's an arc, and then slowly they start to fade until um, the numbers start to diminish and they slow down. And then it's, you know, it's a, it's a parabolic arc, basically. And then there's just a few, and then there's just one going across the sky. So um, go see it at, at the Cole. Um, so just briefly, at the Cole Museum, we faced an interesting challenge. So we, when we first walked into the site, we realized that you spend a lot of time looking out the window, because that's where the views that Cole painted actually are. It's sort of uncanny to see those views in real life, what he painted in his landscape representations. Um, so we knew we wanted to situate the piece outside of a window, and the, the best opportunity seemed to be in Thomas Cole's uh, bedroom itself. Um, and oh yeah, this is just an animation that shows how it would work. And that's, oops, that's how it looks um, uh, on site. And we also have a, a photograph there as well as a publication that we originally made for the show at Massimoka. Um, and I just wanna you know, give uh, thanks to the curators of this exhibition. It's really fantastic. And um, yeah, just encourage everyone to go see it. So we're basically out of time and we intend to keep to our time. Um, I do wanna just note that um, the direction our practice is currently taking is to think about um, place-based investigations and how to represent places visually that encompasses the full depth of a place, which really is a decolonizing effort because that means not starting with these kind of colonizing dates, 1620 or 1859 or whatever in, in California, 1849. Um, and so we've, we've been experimenting with that um, and often taking the form of collage. Um, this is a project based in, in, based in South Park, Colorado. Um, and then recently we've been working um, on a project in the Amazon. And this is some collages we just made last week on a residency that we just finished like today. Um, so this is brand new, uh, brand new work here. Um, so I think we should wrap it up there um, and turn it over to Rachel, who we're very honored to be on a panel with. The last little thing, Toolshed is, is the equivalent of the Canary Project. That's our current uh, platform for activist work. And it's located, physically located um, in Basilica, Hudson um, and in Hudson, New York. So thank you both so much. And thank you to all the institutions that put this together. It's really an honor to be here and to uh, to share my work with you. So um, let's see. Okay, yeah, so uh, eight minutes is a lot time, a lot of, is not very much time to go through uh, thousands of years of history, but uh, we will do our best. Um, so the work that I have uh, up in this exhibition is from my project, The Oldest Living Things in the World. Um, I do, um, I have quite a number of other projects that I've done since then, working with scientists or taking science as an inspiration, uh, but it all started uh, with this tree. Uh, so uh, back in 2004, I traveled to Japan and uh, you know I had just bought a new camera. I was fresh off an artist residency and I didn't really know what I was looking for, uh, but what I did know is that I was interested in expressing something deeper, ironically, you know, using the photograph, which is literally a flat surface, but I was looking for something that would uh, help to connect with the depth and breadth of the human experience through different disciplines. Um, so I became interested in science as a kid. I've always loved nature and I've been uh, very interested in making photographs that um, express some philosophical sense or emotional sense of what was going on in a landscape. Um, so I ended up having the most tremendous experience uh, visiting this tree. It's called Jomonsugi. Um, it's said to be around 7,000 years old, but more accurately, it's closer to um, uh, 2,180 at the time. Um, and it's on this remote island called Yakushima. And I went on this adventure not knowing what to expect. Um, and I ended up uh, through a lot of kismet uh, getting to this tree, making this photograph. Um, but it wasn't at that moment that I got the idea to make the project the oldest living things in the world. Um, this is a map 
that I made at the end of the project. Uh, it did take 10 years. That was not something that I knew at the outset was going to happen. Um, and a map like this didn't exist uh, because there was no, and there is actually no area in the sciences that deals with longevity across species. So not only did I have to figure out that find all of these organisms, I had to figure out what they were first. So it was a little bit of chicken and egg. Uh, once I got started on the work, uh, I got to experience something that was really um, a transformational uh, process for me that, that uh, involved a lot of pushing myself beyond my comfort zone. Uh, this is a 100,000 year old uh, seagrass meadow in the Balearic Islands in Spain. Uh, but I had to learn to scuba dive. I actually learned to scuba dive a couple of years prior to that, photographing a brain coral, which, you know, for some people who love the water, that's not a big deal. But for, if you have a fear of deep water, there's a lot of things to, to overcome. Uh, the beautiful thing about that was that I felt such a sense of purpose in seeking out these organisms, which I really think of as our elders. Um, and as you notice on the map, they're on every continent. Uh, so that was one of the uh, more remarkable things uh, that I found um, doing my research that these organisms really do exist all over the planet. Uh, this is a baobab tree in the Kruger Game Preserve in South Africa that's around 2000. And uh, you know, before I don't want to leave anybody in suspense of what is the oldest known living thing. Um, it is some Siberian actinobacteria uh, that has been living in the Siberian permafrost between 400,000 and 600,000 years. Um, and how can we get away from the subject of climate change? This has lived in this uh, environment um, in the permafrost, which we are finding is not actually, in fact, permanent. Um, this image is of uh, some lichens growing in Greenland, you know, sometimes I'm on these amazing adventures to these really vast landscapes to find something really rather diminutive. Um, and in this case, you know, I love these lichens because they grow one centimeter every hundred years. So a big part of this project is finding ways to connect our humanity to these organisms that have lived these incredibly long lifespans. Um, the reason that, oh, I'm not sure if I mentioned, all of my subjects are 2,000 years old or older. And the reason I chose that number was in part to draw attention to the shallowness of our human timekeeping. You know, why is it 2021 right now? What does that actually mean in the broader context of understanding life on this earth. Um, this is uh, the poster child of the project. This is called the Ureta. Uh, these plants live in the Atacama Desert in Chile. This one is approximately 3,000 years old. And these are shrubs, by the way. They're not moss uh, covering rocks. Uh, really, really remarkable organisms. Um, this is uh, uh, clippings taken from the um, Tasmanian Lomatia, uh, this botanic garden in Hobart. Um, I was not actually granted permission to see this one plant in person because there's literally only one of its kind left on the planet. So it is also growing clonally, meaning that it's self propagating. So for me, this is one of those sort of mind blowing moments where you have this organism that is critically endangered, you can't get more critically endangered, there's literally one left, but it's also theoretically immortal, because it has continued over these many 1000s of years to, uh, to reproduce itself clonally. Um, these are the stromatolites uh, in uh, Western Australia. Um, I'm realizing that I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to skip through a few more of these to um, just to uh, let you see some of the images. Um, this is the this is the 9,550 year old spruce um, that Kate had mentioned. Um, this to me is a portrait of climate change. Um, so you can see the scrubby little mound of branches at the bottom there, and it's not until the past 
uh, 60 years or so that this, that, that long spindly trunk grew um, uh, grew uh, upward on this tree. So this is living on a mountaintop plateau in Sweden where the warming climate, the vegetation zone actually changed. And so a strategy that had been working for this tree for over 9,500 years suddenly changed. And so we can see that climate change is all around us. It's obviously even more so um, uh, when we look at the news these days, you know, I'm sorry, I'm realizing that I am at the end of my time. So um, I am just going to skip through to my last slide, or actually, let me just share this one. Uh, this is uh, the Antarctic moss. Um, if you can see the green on the downward slope there, that is a 5,500 year old moss bank in Antarctica. Uh, perhaps we will chat about that more in the Q&A. Um, and lastly, just wanted to leave you all with the idea of intersecting time scales. And this is a photograph of me uh, taking a picture of a 13,000 year old uh, shrub oak in uh, California. And somehow all of these moments coincided where you have the click of, a sh of the shutter, say 60th of a second, uh, you have this 13,000 year old organism, and then you have me somewhere in between, and yet they all came together to share this moment. So my hope is that by uh, connecting with these organisms that people can start to connect more deeply with deep time. Um, to me, deep time and connecting with long-term thinking is one of the most critical things that we can do in order to help change the direction of what is happening on the planet right now. Um, so I'm gonna, oops, I'm gonna go ahead and stop my share. Um, thank you all very much. And it is my pleasure to introduce Scott. So hello, thank you, Sego uh, Skonagoa. Um, I'm here in Chicago, actually. Um, normally, I'm at Syracuse in Haudenosaunee territory in New York State, where I live and teach. But um, I'm delighted to be part of this this meeting and this conversation, which I think is is really timely, if not urgently so. And um, Thank you very much for including me. I want to, so I'm gonna share my screen as well. And um, let's go to, hopefully you can see that. And so I wanna talk about some intersections here of the contemporary work we've just been looking at and also some of the uh, historic work that it's put in conversation with in context, both at the coal site and at Alana. Um, I've long been a fan of Hudson River painting and um, as a scholar of visual culture and Native American studies, I've always been a bit curious about Thomas Cole and some other artists use or kind of deployment of Native American figures in their art. Um, it's, it's often been noted that uh, the figures are, they seem almost incidental, um, except, I, I guess the exception would be if you know the, the commissioned paintings that illustrate scenes from Cooper's Last of the Mohicans, uh, which I can say a bit about later. There's one of the only areas where you have groups of Native people as opposed to this very common solitary Native figure. And even with the uh, illustrations to scenes from Last of the Mohicans, the, the groups are absolutely minuscule in the context of this overwhelming and romantic and grand and sublime landscape that he places them in. And so, as I said, the images of Last of the Mohicans, they're, they're particular, they're not typical of Cole, and they were commissioned because they're parts of a, a famous national book at that point, and um, as I said, made to order. But if we look at more representative paintings, one of the things you'll notice is that uh, 
Native people have often been interpreted in coal as standing as kind of a signpost or a marker of place and Americanness, um, a way of saying this is North America as opposed to a picture of the Rhine River or some other scenic aspect that, that would be interchangeable with a European locale. And so you have that just kind of very basic notion of uh, how to mark place using a native figure. But it's also been, you know, people given him more credit than that um, to say that there's something romantic in the sense of the solitary native figure contemplating, often contemplating nature, their smallness in the face of nature, and so on. And I think that there is certainly a quality of wanting to depict the so-called noble savage uh, of European invention, as opposed to the other pictorial tradition of native savagery and cruelty and warfare that you get in famous paintings like uh, John Vanderlyn's The Murder of Jane McCrae, or you get in woodcuts illustrating frontier violence and so on. You don't have anything like that in Cole. You have this, as I said, kind of noble solitary figure seemingly engaged in the contemplation of, of nature. One thing I, I would also note though about that solitariness is the absence of our communities, right? You don't get a sense when looking at a native peoples as having villages, having communities, having a society, having a civilization. They're much more like a kind of solitary wanderer in this beautiful space. And the other thing I note is that he very often puts native people in the context of either an impending storm or um, maybe dusk, um, you know, Indian at sunset, th this will become in later 19th century painting, a way of embracing what scholars sometimes call the declension narrative, right? A narrative of decline, that Native people started out at 100% of the population of the Americas, and then are on this inevitable decline to extinction, frankly. I mean, this is the this is the aspiration of a lot of 19th century thinkers. And I, I like to put this in the context of, of the whole notion of extinction, some of the stuff that Ed and Susanna were talking about with the passenger pigeon, the the sense of declension, removal, vanishing. There's a word if people, if you know me, you know I really hate that word vanishing Indian because it, it just totally ignores the agency of that word, you know, as though native people that we vanished. And in fact, the question we should be asking is who vanished the Indian from the landscape? And so, these pictures are, are evocative of this to me, but also make me think of what are, what could we have learned in a way from these figures before they were ushered off into the sunset, off to the West figuratively and in real terms. I think of other ways that landscape artists from the Hudson River School used landscape, atmosphere, as preludes to things like the oncoming civil war. The famous Frederick Church painting, Twilight in the Wilderness, and another Sanford Gifford, Coming Storm, both 1860. The country is on the verge of a cataclysmic civil war that will take hundreds of thousands of lives and displace many others. And I think of that similarly, that there's this notion of impending doom that these, this is political doom in the case of um, both Church and Gifford, but there's also, I think, a way for us now to look at it through a different lens at the other coming storms. It's interesting when I got looking at the Gifford painting that I noted 
that there is a group of native people right here where I'm circling my cursor. Um, it's very hard to see there are some bark wigwams behind them and they stand on the shore of a definitely coming storm. And one thinks the coming storm is not just coming for the Union and the Confederacy. The coming storm is coming for Native American peoples across North America. Remember, immediately following the Civil War, we have the Indian Wars as it goes from one to another. A way of unifying North and South was to have a new common enemy, that's Native America, and a new goal, our lands. And so that coming storm, I don't think Gifford intended to be speaking to the issue of Native America. But again, it is very much part, when I look at that painting, of who is in the way of that impending disaster. Add to that, I think, of the impending environmental disaster. And therefore, I want to talk just briefly about two things that I wish any of those painters would have asked, at least of Haudenosaunee and other peoples in the Northeast, about our, what I would call an ethos of sustainability. This wampum belt, which represents a treaty from 1701 between native nations, including the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, we call the dish with one spoon. And that's our, our notion of the sustainability and shareability of resources, that everyone must take their turn with that one spoon and take from nature, take from our resources, only as much as they need, never more. Nothing saved up, nothing, nothing hoarded, nothing taken for profit. And that's a core value in our culture to this day, the dish with one spoon. I wish this were taught in every elementary school. Similarly, our concept of seven generations thinking. Listening to Rachel talk about those incredible ancient living species, is humbling when you think of human history. And one of the things in Haudenosaunee culture is to talk about any meaningful decision a community makes must be made by imagining collectively the impact seven generations down the road. So that we wonder, will they seven generations, maybe only 140, 210 years down the road, Will they praise our wisdom or will they damn our short-sightedness? And if we could only engage in that in a real way, I think we would be on a way to, rep to reclaiming some of this ethos of what I call an ethos of sustainability. This is a, a, sculptural, a sculptural representation of um, seven generations that is in Warwick, New York at Frederick uh, Franks former studio grounds. And I, I like it just because of this visual echoing um, with the river behind it. But that sense of our responsibility, our curatorship um, is part of what I think we could regain when we look at these paintings and are reminded of a different set of values and a different ethos regarding the environment and where we might go to answer some questions. I know I'm out of time, so I will stop sharing and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Stevens. Let's all uh, turn our cameras and microphones back on and get into a conversation here. Um, please, those of you in attendance, feel free to send in questions via the chat. Um, I know Kate and I will have some of our own. I'm certainly bursting with new ones beyond those that we prepared from all this rich context, all these layers you've added uh, to our collaborative project. Would you like to start, Kate? Sure, yeah, that was just so fascinating. I too have all these new questions. We do have a set of questions to kick it off and the exhibition Cross Pollination looks at the past, present and future. So our questions are also going to follow this format. Um, and we have three to start off with, and I'll just do the first one, um, but it, it definitely sounds like there are. Um, for each of you, are there historic figures, artists, scientists, writers, thinkers 
um, texts or ideas that serve as a source of inspiration to you and your work. And Scott, definitely just what you were saying about asking about um, the ethos of sustainability um, is something I find really fascinating. So whoever wants to take that, but we're interested in how the past and um, what in history is a source of inspiration or something we should be looking at today. Oh, I'll share. <laughs> um, so um, for me, um, when I mentioned I was hoping we would get back to talking about that image of Antarctica, um, I, while I was doing my project, I was, while I was actually traveling to Antarctica, I read um, Ernest Shackleton's book, um, The Endurance. And um, for me, it's an interesting, uh, it was such an interesting moment to be actually in the physical place where he was. So that moss that I photographed was literally right around the corner from where his crew was marooned. So I don't know if everyone doesn't know the story, this was a hundred years ago in the heroic age of Antarctic exploration where everybody was rushing to do, um, you know, to be the first to the South Pole, to be that they were trying to be the first to cross Antarctica with dog sleds. That sort of thing doesn't really impress me. You know, it's like, it says there's something very macho about like, I wanted the first, the biggest, the best. Um, but what actually happened uh, was his, his ship sank and his crew was marooned. They were nowhere near where they were supposed to be. And they ended up coming to their own rescue. So for me, this is such a beautiful metaphor. You know, they set off to do one thing with a sort of very limited kind of macho idea of what their mission was. And then ultimately, you know, they had to figure out how to save themselves. Um, they were, uh, as I mentioned, they were nowhere near where they were supposed to be. They had to, um, several of his men had went in a, a essentially a rowboat uh, across some of the worst ocean in the world to find a whaling outpost. And to me, there's this moment um, of thinking about the perseverance that's required and the ingenuity um, and a sense of, of self uh, that you would need to be uh, in order to survive something as extreme as being dropped in Antarctica. You know, and right now in this moment, we're all dropped in the moment of climate change. And we had all these ideas about what we were meant to do. And it's time in this moment to pivot into, into something else. And so I find that, um, I found that story really uh, moving. No, uh, sorry. Um, I was just going to say as an object or a thing that I guess the the wampum belts, the historic ones that I'm familiar with, not just the dish with one spoon, which is one I love, but the two row wampum, um, the ever growing pine wampum. These are things that have instructed our communities for centuries, if not millennia. And I think that the power of those mnemonic devices, which because they're not written language, demand you know them to speak them, right? I remember once um, my grandmother, when I had this you know, teenage moment of junior anthropologist, I was going to tape, I was gonna make tapes of her telling traditional <laughs> stories and she said, no way. And not because she had any fear of that, but she said, if you tape them, you won't know them. They'll just be in a resource. You could put them on a shelf and they won't be yours. They won't be in your head. You won't have memorized them and carry them and you can't repeat them. You'll have to go look it up. And she said, that's not what it's about. You know? And I feel like the same is true of the belts that we have to learn them, it's our responsibility. Other than, otherwise they're just pretty decorations, but um, there's so much more than that. Yeah, actually just related to um, what you spoke of just now, Scott, um, I think of Donna Haraway's work and Staying with the Trouble where she, you know, encourages us to really sense ourselves as compost and her writing is just so evocative of, you know, this kind of, connect positive connection or possible connection with with the earth and you know getting our, our feet in into the earth i think apropos what rachel was saying i mean we definitely need new structures of thinking and we very much believe in the connection between 
worldviews or thinking epistemologies and the way we are in the world, you know, the way we exist in it, the kind of actions we choose to take. And so for us, you know, increasingly, I think this has been trying to think past, think an alternative to, um, you know, extractive sensibilities, colonial sensibilities. And so necessarily that has led us to a number of indigenous thinkers and um, you know, Vine Deloria, Scott himself, Robin Kimmer, um, uh, and also representations of indigenous thought, which I'm, you know, I, I think is interesting to think about. Some of them, Eduardo Viviero Castro, who writes about perspectivism in the, um, in the Amazon, which is a completely alternative way of seeing the world in, in his telling. Um, but also how these are kind of refracted to contemporary thinkers. One that comes to mind is Edouard Glissant. Um, and in particular, Glissant, who's a Caribbean uh, writer, poet, theorist, uh, novelist, um, um, put forth an idea of two forms of understanding. Um, one, uh, which he called in French, comprendre, which has like, you know, the sense of grabbing or grasping. And another that he coined the phrase donna avec, which means sort of a give on and with, is how it's sometimes translated. And Vine Deloria, who I mentioned earlier, once said that, that um, it's not just by becoming more rational about something, that we become more conscious of it. And I think appreciating, valuing, um, and enacting these different forms of understanding are, are super important. And that's how I think we see even the contemplative work that we're doing as artists as part of our activist impulse. Um, so yeah, there's more thinkers we could, we could talk about, but those are certainly some crucial ones. Thank you. Some additional fascinating layers for our interpretation. I'm so relieved to hear from Rachel that we're right to talk up the Shackleton story on our tours and uh, you've given us a lot to work with and think with there. Uh, another question for all three of you is, uh, what do you think are the most critical uh, issues from a 2021 perspective? Um, how do you feel like your work contributes to a discussion around these issues and contributes to conversations around loss and climate change? I guess, I mean, uh, it would be a grand thing to say that my work contributed in some important way, but I hope that um, I hope what I can accomplish with my students certainly is to make them aware of alternative ways of thinking of these things that are ancient, they're not new, they're sustaining, um, to make them think of the difference between a culture that looks at nature as property versus one that looks at it as a place of duty and you know, custodial relationship rather than the owner's relationship. But I, I think if, um, and, and these aren't, you know, just located in North America, these are indigenous values in, in Africa and in Aotearoa and Australia, South America. And there are all these voices that we're not listening to there. And we're kind of expecting Western science to solve this still. And I think that might be a dead end. Yeah, I, I agree with Scott on that, that there needs, it, obviously we respect science or else we wouldn't even know what climate change is. <laughs> you know, I think climate, Western science has identified this problem, has used its data aggregating powers to uh, see something that I think we wouldn't otherwise see. Um, but there's something about the authority of scientific understanding as it applies to any number of disciplines, history, just the way we look at this world as a kind of end, means end proposition. Um, and that's why I do think that, that um, you know, efforts of, of thinkers, artists, et cetera, are not marginal in this way. I think there's, they're, they're providing um, a different picture. Um, I mean, I, I have to beg to differ with my collaborator. I think actually that science is one modality for understanding climate change, but I think farmers, I think many people who are actually connected with the earth have been, um, identifying these changes uh, already. Um, and it, it's that kind of connectedness um, and, and not, as Scott says, I think relying on, on science to save us um, from, from these from climate change that we kind of need to move um, away from what I think is a, a, just a, a great deal of like worry into action. I think it's it's an error to, to to demonize science. I mean, that's one of the values of Robin Kimmerer's work is she manages to articulate a proposition whereby these two types of knowledges can coexist. Um, so I think there's possibilities for that. Yeah. 
Uh, I'd like to, to build on everything that, that you all have said. Um, um, you know, for me, making the Oldest Living Things Project, my hope was to help create a personal relationship with these organisms so that also it wasn't just humans are bad. Humans are bad. And so because we're not going to create anything from a place of punishment. Um, I, I completely respect and rely on the science and my own personal path has actually led me and now in a program at the Center for Sacred Studies um, where um, studying earth-based ways of prayer. And you know, for me, the biggest, if there was one thing that I would want to share with everyone that I feel like is the is a path forward out of the crisis that we're in, it's to do our individual healing work. You know, humans have so many, you know, speaking of seven generations forward and seven generations back, we have so many generations of trauma. We have so many generations where we have made the wrong choices or we haven't done the personal work and sort of vomited, uh, vomited it up to the next, onto the next generation. And we are here at this critical moment where we do absolutely need to take into account everything that is happening um, from an environmental standpoint, just as much from a social standpoint. And uh, my personal path has, has keeps coming back to, you know, if we can make the, make a safe container to heal ourselves, we're gonna start making really different choices um, as a species on the whole planet. Um, yeah. I think that's all so interesting. And, you know, one of the things, you know, we were really thinking about, you know, Cole, for instance, wrote, you know, prolifically against unchecked development and industry and deforestation that was happening from the tanneries and the building of the railroads um, and was kind of advocating for balance and church and heed also were, you know, doing important and influential work thinking about that balance. And one of the ideas within the exhibition is this idea like, you know, there's people are taking from nature and using up the resources and mining it. And so one of the things we wanted to think about with this exhibition and which a number of artists are thinking about um, is how can we shift that response to the natural world and see that we are kind of an interconnected, interdependent whole with other species and other life. And um, can we shift this response of mining to one of reciprocity and giving back? Um, and what does that mean? And so I guess, you know, what does that, you know, thinking about the future, like it's one thing to talk about all of these ideas and, um, but, you know, in thinking about actions, are there specific things that any of you would recommend to our listeners or our communities um, to take action that will empower difference. And I think you all have kind of touched on some of this already, but if you have more to add to that, um, it'd be wonderful to hear your thinking. I would, I would add, I mean, there are so many ways to try to, that each of us want to try and help, but um, some very basic pragmatic things <laughs> in terms of, um, I'm very concerned with students when I teach um, how little they know about their lived in environment. So there's units to every part of my big introduction to indigenous studies. And one of them is on indigenous people and the environment. And I always offer to their surprise the day of the test that any one of them can get out of the test with a passing grade if they will take me outside on campus and identify five plants and no one has ever taken me up on it. And I said, it could be anything. It could be dandelion, oak tree, pine tree. I wouldn't even say what kind of pine tree, you know, <laughs> but um, it, it just amazes me. And um, I've had some friends that have taken me at my word and you know they have young kids and they're like we're gonna know what these things are you know um we're gonna know our environment better know the plants know the animals etc because otherwise it's fairly indifferent and abstract 
act, you know. And um, I, I just think you need, it doesn't have to be some, you know, magical spiritual relationship to those things, but simply a knowledge of them. It's like knowing your food, you know, <laughs> type of thing. And um, so I think that's just a very basic, but I, I believe it is a start of a kind of mindfulness as the end goal. Thanks. I love that. I just, you know, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I, you know, I think from my own path that was, got, got me started just to, you know, recognizing which flowers came up first in the spring and, and knowing that the same turtle came back every year and, and these sort of things that are really a source of wonderment, you know, if we start to, to realize and recognize how, you know, if, if maybe somebody knows who, um, said this quote that either you can look at the world in two ways, either as um, nothing is a miracle or everything is. Um, and you know, certainly the latter is gonna be, <laughs> gonna be the better. Um, and I also just wanted to um, dovetail on what um, you all said uh, about storytelling. And I'm actually thinking of a particular podcast um, by Robin Wall Kimmerer talking about the service fairy. I imagine um, that you've heard that. Um, it's such a beautiful story interweaving indigenous knowledge with science and with understanding what our personal path is through to understand that our worldview creates our world. And when we tell stories that help us expand our worldview and not just expand, but to be, to be willing to actually have our entire worldview change. Um, so I know that might sound a little abstract, but I think that when we can connect with the ideas of things that are bigger than ourselves, and again, take care of those wounds, then we can start to come together collectively in order to both honor what we have and to co-create what we want to see in the future. Thank you, Rachel. That's really well said, beautifully said. Um, yeah, I mean, we also echo these thoughts on, on a worldview change, even at a subtle level, like Scott's talking about, just being more aware, being more enchanted um, by the world. Um, but I want, also want to add, um, in addition to that, because I don't think it has been said yet, but I do think that um, social movements, you know, civil disobedience, protests are also super important and actually do put pressure uh, on politicians to affect change. So. You know, we've done a lot of work with 350.org throughout our career. Um, the new movements that are very youth-led, I think have, are really inspiring to me, like the Sunrise Movement um, and Extinction Rebellion. And all these organizations will have very local actions you could take. They'll, they'll, they'll point you on a map. They're very good at, at, at locating uh, a specific action in the local community. Um, and as far as that goes too, I also wanna say something about how, um, I think we need to acknowledge at this point that climate change is here. Um, and it's, you know, we started out our mission of trying to sound the warning sign, the canary in the coal mine and so on. Um, and we're leaving that behind a little bit now. I think, you know, I think what we need now is tools for figuring out how to live with and through it. And that is going to be a mind shift change. And I think a lot of the weather we're seeing this summer is really the beginning. Um, and uh, so given that, I think efforts to support local resiliency and community building are, are very real ways of, of addressing the climate crisis today or, or um, you know, dealing with the future. Um, and so there's a number in the Hudson, we're really blessed to be moving to the Hudson Valley where I think there's a lot of uh, critical mass of these uh, types of engagements. Um, you know, just to shout out some of them like Soul Fire Farm is really inspiring to us, Media Sanctuary in Troy, New York, um, the Partners for Climate Action in Hudson Valley. Um, uh, the Silica Hudson itself, the way Silica is reconfiguring its mission around these problems is super inspiring and we're proud to be a part of that. Um, and Toolshed itself is really thinking about local resiliency. How do we build the commons? You know, how do we, you can opt into the commons in a way you can't opt into world capitalism. You can build common resources in, in local communities and that's really empowering. That really feels like something you can do. Um, so, so I wanted to mention that as well. 
there's so many rich layers here to think with. Um, you're, you're conjuring all these associations and hopes that the, the humanities and the arts in particular can um, help us to find different ways of thinking in concert with science, not in opposition to science. And, and hopefully this project um, shows some of those uh, propositions and solutions. Um, we, we see in this project uh, responses to historic trauma as well as, as a word that Rachel brought into the project and you make me think of this uh, powerful Gene Shin installation at Olana where we are naming names, knowing names of plants as, as Scott says, the hemlock, uh, where we have the historic trauma of the tanneries decimating millions of that species and the, the current trauma of the hemlock woolly adelgid. Can nature itself have uh, intergenerational trauma? Um, so many uh, things to think with here. Um, we have one um, listener support, uh, attendee sub submitted question that maybe can be broadened out to all. Uh, my colleague Liz at Olana um, directs this initially to Rachel, but we can expand outward. Uh, there's curiosity about um, the process uh, for all three of you uh, in your um, distinct but related projects. Um, how do you, uh, in the most instrumental way, find the, the focus of your work, um, make the work, find that inspiration, and um, carry it through to an audience? Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. I actually, I, in all my excitement, I actually skimmed over what I had intended to share about an action that we can do. So I'll just add that first. Uh, I would highly recommend to everyone who doesn't have a garden to garden, um, plant trees, um, investigate uh, native species in, in your area. Um, there's no better way to connect with nature than to be in nature itself. And there's something really special about caring for even house plants, caring for plants, but the, the being, getting your hands in the soil and in the garden is the really special experience. Um, so, um, yeah, so for me, for the Oldest Living Things project, you know, I shared a little bit in my, my talk that, you know, I didn't know what I, I knew I wanted to do something, I just didn't know what it was. And so I think of that period as, as being in creative churn and uh, just being in a place of openness and investigation and trying to see what, um, what felt right, like what, what really, um, really caught that creative spark for me. Uh, because if you don't love what you're doing, it's way too much work. You can't force yourself to, to I mean, plenty of, of creative people sort of force themselves into, into projects. For me, one of the most exciting moments was realizing that this didn't exist as an area of, science, of study in the sciences, like looking at longevity across species. And so um, thank goodness I live in the internet age uh, because this would have taken my entire lifetime uh, in a, if I'd come up in a previous generation trying to do this work. Did a lot of Google searches. I, try, I spoke to, uh, the first scientist that I spoke to was in the, um, the New York Botanic Garden in the Bronx who told me that I, you know, I thought I'd have one scientific collaborator and he said, nope, nobody, does, this is too broad. We're, nobody's, we're not qualified. So that meant I had to become qualified, which was, you know, it was really exciting um, and daunting as well. Uh, so, you know, I searched for scientific public uh, research papers, published scientific research papers. I really wanted the science to be accurate. And when there wasn't accurate science, you know, in my book, I, I wrote an essay about each of these as well. So there's a lot of folklore and amazing stories from the communities um, that, uh, that really um, both protect and also promote some of these organisms and some of them nobody had ever seen of seen or heard of before in which case the scientists were so thrilled that somebody had heard of their incredibly esoteric life's work that they were so open and excited uh, to have another way to connect uh, their work with the outside world uh, so I'll just conclude by saying that um, one of the big things that I realized through the process was that we really are so siloed. You know, I'm in this discipline, I'm in that discipline, but that's not how humans work and that's not actually how the world works. And so by starting to break these things down and look from a, you know, maybe it's considered a 30,000 foot view, like what are all the different aspects? Um, uh, what are all the nuances? What are all the different ways that uh, all aspects of living things all of our all of our relations are all interconnected.
no other takers for that process question. There's a curiosity about how you find your subject. I just, I would say, I mean, since I'm not an artist, um, that in my own scholarship, one of the things I'm most interested in doing is finding things that from the distant past, from archives and museums, and following the trace of their, their legacy and how they interact with the contemporary world. Um, I'm, you know, so when I look at some of those coal paintings, I'm not so interested in the elusive notion of regaining his intention at putting a native figure in there, as I am looking at this beautiful painting and asking the questions that I want to ask of it today. You know, what would I, what would I want to know from that native figure about that landscape? And um, the same with a wampum belt or a missionary um, tract describing Haudenosaunee culture in the 17th century. I want to try to find how does it relate to us, if at all, and bring it into contemporary life and the lives of my students and others. Um, it, the, the process for History of the Future, the first project we showed, and the very similar map that we showed to Rachel's was actually really similar to Rachel's in the sense of uh, talking to scientists, reading their peer review journal article, and, and then having this sense of, of taking this, you know, peer review journal article that's kind of, you know, buried in some uh, expert publication somewhere and kind of bringing that, um, uh, embodying that or bringing that to a different public. Um, and, but lately, lately, I think the sites that we're taking are following this trajectory of looking for places where um, we can tell a story of time, um, but human time that's, that's, that's deeper than this kind of colonial beginning that we're talking about. And that's what's led us to the Amazon. The other reason we went to the Amazon um, is that in Ecuador, um, their constitution has granted sovereignty um, to natural things like watersheds or rivers. And it's also branched sovereignty to indigenous people to control their territory. So it's an extremely interesting uh, contemporary model of, of effective politics, um, as well as being this very rich uh, region uh, and a very important region for the world. Yeah. Well, I hate to be the one that has to call time. Um, if we're all finished uh, with all the questions and comments, I'd just like to thank our generous panelists for their inspiring and important work offering us such perspective, uh, our partners for their amazing curation and fruitful collaboration on this event and our audience for your participation today. As the impacts of climate change are clearly accelerating, there is perhaps no more important moment for us to be creating and conversing around our shared environment, which I hope will lead us to action, to living by as Scott suggests an ethos of sustainability to sharing that one spoon, to thinking differently and listening to ancient voices. We hope you will continue this conversation and investigation and please visit Cross Pollination on view through October 31st. Thank you all and have a wonderful evening. <laughs>